Okay, so let's let's start. So welcome everyone to our online workshop. It's going to be today on Industry 4.0, and we are going to, going to look at Industry 4.0 infrastructures and how to diffuse Industry 4.0 uh, technologies. And we're going to be together for around three hours, so it's going to be really nice. So welcome from my side. Uh, I'm Arno Morrison, um, one of the experts at the policy learning platform in research and innovation. And with uh, Mark Pattinson, we are going to be the fantastic duo uh, moderating this online workshop. Mark, are you here? Words of welcome. I'm here. And as Arno said, uh, you get two for the price of one with uh, the policy learning platform. So uh, we will be here to guide and, and, and shape the discussions, but we're particularly interested in hearing from you the various uh, opportunities that this type of workshop provides. So don't hesitate to use the, uh, the online, the questions and the, uh, the informal exchange moments that will be described to you shortly. So thanks for joining us. Thank you, Mark. And indeed, uh, exciting program. We have great speakers, great presentations, and of course, opportunity, opportunities to, to network and meet uh, each others. Uh, let me say just one word. Uh, so this uh, workshop is part of an online workshop uh, series. And next week is going to be our colleagues from SME Competitiveness. Uh, so it's going to be Wednesday, 10 of November, same hours, exactly same hours. And here they're going to look at SME uh, digital transformation. So a great uh, workshop as well. And do not hesitate to register. All the information are online as well. And before we move on, I will give the floor to Elena for a very uh, short presentation on Interreg Europe and the policy learning platform. Elena, the floor is yours. You have like three, four minutes. Yes. Thank you, Arno. Thank you, Mark. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Elena Ferrari. I'm the thematic manager of the Interreg Europe Policy Learning Platform. I oversee the work of the, of the platform over the four topics of the program. If you are here, it means that you know a little bit of Interreg Europe. But still, let me uh, just set uh, the uh, framework that allows us to be here today. Um, for those of you who um, maybe uh, know just a little bit of the program, um, this is the only Interreg, U Interreg program that allows uh, all uh, EU countries to work together, including Norway and Switzerland. Um, and uh, it is a program that is fully dedicated to capacity building. So it is really uh, the program that allows practitioners of uh, regional development policies on the topics that you see on the screen to exchange their experiences to learn how to better design and manage regional policies. Um, there have been uh, 359 million euros invested in this program during the period 2014 and 2020 and the program will soon be ready to start a new um, generation of uh, financing opportunities in the upcoming months. And uh, beyond the usual, let's say, the traditional way of working with uh, co-financing projects, Interreg Europe has also started this new feature that is now not new anymore called the Policy Learning Platform. And the Policy Learning Platform is a space that allows anybody that is interested in regional development to exchange to connect with other colleagues across Europe to learn about good practices that exist uh, around all our regions and cities and to uh, yeah, create networks. And we do this uh, within, of course, all the different Interreg Europe projects that are financed, but also beyond that, we also connect with um, organizations and policymakers that are not financed by projects, but are simply interested in these topics. And we offer equal opportunities to everybody. So um, the policy learning platform 
uh, if you if you're here once again it means that you know a little bit uh, what we do meaning that we organize such events like the one of today workshops webinars uh, discussions online and on site back soon again um, we uh, have different um, types of publications that we um, produce also and we have our um, rich tool of uh, the Good Practice Database, which collects more than 2,000 uh, by now good practice that are validated by our experts, such as, of course, Arno and Mark today, but also on other topics and other experts that form the team of the policy learning platform. And once these good practices are validated, it means that they pass a sort of a, uh, a check uh, by our experts that uh, look at the transferability uh, potential of the good practices, which is very important if you want to get inspiration and use those uh, maybe in your own territory. Um, what you may be less aware of, though, is um, another type of service that the policy learning platform offer, uh, which is called the uh, expert support service and we have three different uh, ones uh, we have help desks we have uh, matchmaking sessions but i would like to focus today mainly on one specific service which is called the peer reviews <clears throat> the peer reviews are um, two-day meetings where we focus uh, in particular in uh, the policy challenge of one specific uh, organization that uh, asks us for help. Um, you have a specific challenge that you want to uh, look at in your territory. You have to design a new um, your new uh, innovation policy, for instance. You have to look into the measures that perhaps did not work so well and you want to improve those. Well, you can always ask the policy learning platform for help. And what we do is that we organize it all. We um, connect you with a number of peers, so of, uh, let's say, representatives of organizations across Europe that have some experience, ex precise expertise that they can share with you. And we make them all work together, really with the objective of giving you uh, the most hands-on, the most concrete uh, advice, recommendation for you to uh, perhaps improve your own policy. Um, there is a, a very, very easy process, application process to uh, go through, but it's extremely easy and not at all uh, bothersome. And um, you can have all the information that you need at the website uh, address that you see on the screen. In particular now, well, you see on the screen also some examples of peer reviews that uh, our colleagues Mark and Arno have already implemented uh, in Sweden, in Bulgaria, in Haut de France, sorry, in France. And uh, in particular, um, I also would like to uh, maybe mention the fact that we are currently uh, looking for peers, so looking for experts and practitioners um, in on the topic of uh, centers of competence and centers of excellence, because our colleagues at the Ministry of Education and Science in Bulgaria are asking again for help. So they have already done a peer review. They liked it. They appreciate our work. And now they would like to focus more on a specific aspect of, uh, of, this, uh, of, of their somehow implementation of these uh, centers of competence and excellences. So you're very welcome to, uh, why not, uh, uh, propose your participation as peer in this peer review that will take place in December, like in a month's time. So very happy to get your candidatures. Please do not hesitate to contact me or Mark or Arno. And perhaps, with this, uh, Elena, you can perhaps put the link uh, of, on the, in the chat later during our discussion for the PM I will interview. definitely, of course. Excellent. Thank you very much, Elena. And in, indeed, peer reviews, great op opportunities, and we encourage you to apply for one. Why not an industry 4.0? infrastructures or how to diffuse uh, industry 4.0 technologies. So let's have a quick look at the agenda of today. Uh, so we start with two great uh, keynote speakers. Uh, Martin Humer from uh, the European Commission will uh, discuss a little bit more about this new emerging concept of industry 5.0. Then we move on to my mentor, uh, Pierre-Alexandre Ballon, because he was my supervisor uh, in my PhD. 
and we will look at uh, regional opportunities uh, for industry 4.0 um, you know using evidence-based approach uh, then in the second uh, session we move on to good practices uh, here we will look at the swiss uh, smart factory in uh, Biel in switzerland with uh, dominic uh, gorecki and uh, looking also at the flanders make uh, with uh, Rir van der kerkhoff in flanders and we will have two uh, different discussion talking about their experience and reflecting on the keynote speakers and the good practices. Uh, we will have uh, Rore Muyo from Cantabria and we will have Spela Seknik uh, from Slovenia. And then the third session is about thematic working groups. So it's about uh, learning from each other. So interregional learning exchanges uh, be ready to prepare a slide and share with us your Industry 4.0 policy initiatives and what you are doing in your region. So it will be a very informal uh, way to exchange uh, among each other and among peers and participants. And for those who have um, registered for online policy app desk, uh, you can uh, stay with us for, for a little bit of time. Uh, and we will have like this one-to-one, uh, -one, face to face uh, exchanges on your policy challenges. Eugenie, you will tell us, can you tell us a little bit more about Zoom? Very brief technical details and what's uh, the 10 minutes break? Eugenie, are you here? Yes, I am Excellent. here. I don't know if you can uh, see me or hear me, but sure. So uh, after the first session at 2.50, we will have a 10 minute uh, break. So I will assign you all to a room. You will be in a room with uh, six other people and it will be an opportunity for you to meet uh, the other participants and maybe uh, the speakers. So you do not uh, have anything else to do except, uh, except uh, the invitation to join the breakout room. And except. Excellent, perfect. So 10 minutes in the break for networking opportunities. So you can ask where you're from, are you part of an interregular project? Why are you interested uh, in industry 4.0 and so on and so on. Also, uh, policy learning platform, we, Elena mentioned, you know, expert support, but we also have a knowledge hub and some of our knowledge hub, um, we have some very nice articles and a very nice policy brief on Industry uh, 4.0. So we encourage you to have a, a look at it. Eugenie will put the link in uh, the chat so you can have a look at our Industry 4.0 policy brief. But without further ado, let's move on to our keynote speakers, Martin and uh, Pierre-Alexandre Ballon. Martin from the European Commission, Industry 5.0, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much. So I try to to share my screen. Yes. Yes, it's good. Full screen I just, mode. I just have to switch to full screen mode. So. Excellent. So I hope this is now. Perfect. You have 10 I will minutes. Minimize please. this here. Okay. Perfect. Um, yes, uh, so my name is Martin Huimer. I'm in the in DG Research and Innovation, so in the uh, Directorate General for Research and Innovation in a directorate which is called Prosperity, which gives you already an uh, indication that we, uh, uh, that we, even in the administration, we have uh, make a sort of shift because before it was just industrial technologies. Huh? My task is not to give you an, um, as first of all, many thanks for this honorable invitation. I, I don't want to forget that. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. And my task is to give you a sort of overview on uh, Industry 5.0, which is a relatively new concept, although its main elements are quite known for a very long time. So it's, it's primarily also, a, 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 I would say, a shift of perspective. Let's start with uh, the usual thing with uh, the changes induced by the digital digitalization and uh, digital technologies. As you all know, we are 
already experienced this incredible change due to powerful digital technologies and due to innovations enabled by these digital technologies. And this is transforming not only European industry, but also our whole society. It transforms European industry by enabling us to increase or enabling industry to increase the efficiency and productivity enormous. It accelerates the production processes. And I would say in, 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 the nut, in a nutshell, this is what uh, Industry 4.0 is about. So a technology driven uh, transformation towards uh, increased efficiency and productivity. But of course, the digitalization will also change the uh, society and in particular also the role of workers. Uh, this, uh, the, 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 the digital transformation uh, holds a number of um, incredible potential also, also to improve the working conditions for the workforce. For example, the increased flexibility may lead to a better work-life balance. Uh, the <clears throat> digital technologies together with robots can can help workers to uh, to get rid of boring tasks of arduous tasks of, of, of dangerous tasks so there is a lot of potential of industry 4.0 also for the for the well-being and for the for the for the situation of the workers the question is does this is this intrinsically in in industry 4.0 does this happen automatically is there a sort of trickle down effect so we increase uh, efficiency and productivity and the situation for the workforce will be better. Well, I have my doubts and I just have here an example, a quotation from a report made by Oxfam. Uh, the, the people there looked into the working conditions in parts of, of, of sectors of our economy and these are worrying results. So there are sometimes working conditions which are awful and uh, which uh, the workforce has to endure because otherwise they would lose their job. So there is no automatically a benefit from uh, industry for pensioners to, to, to workers. Uh, what's about the environment or to make it, uh, to, to ask this question more in a, in, a, in a broader context, is this transformation we, uh, we are in, is it sustainable and is it resilient? Well, with resilience, just remember uh, one ship blocking the Suez Canal made repercussions in global delivery chains, which are still visible uh, two or three months after this event. So this is one example or the other example is the problems the, in, in Asia with the production of semiconductor chips, uh, which in fact leads to uh, into a, a scaling down of the economic forecast for economic growth in certain European countries, including Germany. So we're far from a, a situation where we have a resilient economy or a resilient industry. And a similar thing holds for, holds for, for sustainability. So the Commission has, uh, of course, recognized that. And if you look into the six major priorities of this Commission, which were formulated by our President Ursula von der Leyen, you see that in particular three of them address exactly what I said before. So we have the European Green Deal, which is basically a transformation towards a much more sustainable system. We have to make Europe fit for the digital age. So we need to be on the forefront of this digital uh, revolution and we, and we need to shape it. But we have to do all that in a way, this transformation, to steer this transformation in a way which respects the European value, which puts humans in the center. So what we call, we have to build an economy that works for people. And basically these three elements are already the pillars of the Industry 5.0 concept. So Industry 5.0 is an industry which is sustainable. So it leads actions on sustainability and respects the planetary boundaries. It's an industry which is resilient. So it's uh, adaptable, it's flexible, it can adapt to changing circumstances and it's agile and uh, also uh, forward-looking. And last but not least, Industry 5.0 is a human-centric industry. So it promotes talents, it promotes diversity and it empowers people. Uh, the, the, the really important uh, point here is we see Industry 5.0 as, as an uh, indispensable part of this transformation. So we need industry to proceed towards a more sustainable uh, um, uh, future. So industry 5.0 
recognizes that the industry is uh, a major provider of solutions for, for society and a resilient provider of prosperity and uh, it uh, while respecting the boundaries of our planet. So it, however, the question is uh, what's, why should a company embark in something like industry uh, 5.0? What, what's in, what is, the, what is the business case there? Huh? Okay, you can look what would be the positive impacts for the workforce. Uh, of course, industry 4.0 would make their their situation, it would improve the safety and, and the well-being. It will empower workers, so they remain in control. So it's not, uh, they have to adapt to new technologies, but it's, it's the other way around. What can new technologies provide, uh, which means can new technology provide for workers to make their job better, to make the job uh, in, in more productive, more high quality and to have a more, a more satisfaction. Of course, this also means that the workforce has uh, to continuously involve the skills. They have to be agile, they have to be creative. These are, uh, it, it's, it's a sort of, these are high, uh, more high quality uh, jobs than, than before. Huh? Uh, for the employers, uh, what is in there? Of course, reduced cost due to research efficiency, this, this is evident, but they will also be more competitive by attracting the best talent, and I come to that in a, in a minute. So in, 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 to, to, to sum this up, they will have the competitive edge in new markets, and if you think one of the of the strengths of European industry is the so-called green industry, and that's, by the way, also due to a um, a quite strict regulation, uh, regulatory side. Huh? So uh, it's not a burden, but it is in future an uh, asset. This is what we are convinced of. Uh, if you look on the right side, so Industry 5.0 is not a provider of shareholder value, but it's much broader. It's a provider of solutions for people and for our planet. I said uh, attracting the best talents can make our uh, industry more competitive. What I mean with that is there are already sectors in the economy where you have a scarcity of skills, yeah, digital technologies, etc. Uh, so there will be or is already a competition for the best people, for the best brains. So the question is, what are the, the, the features or the criteria for these young people to, uh, to make the decision uh, which job they take? Yeah? It's obvious from a number of studies that young people want employers who share their values. For example, three quarters of millennials would take a pay cut uh, into account or would, would uh, accept a pay cut if they can in turn work for a social responsible company or uh, nearly 50% uh, of generations said they said they would prioritize a job which offers them flexibility, freedom and uh, mobility. Yeah? On the other hand, uh, the, the World Economic Forum has interviewed CEOs and uh, many of them said, first of all, there is a, a, a tremendous demand for reskilling of workforce in the next five years due to these uh, new emerging technologies and uh, the creati creativity gets more and more important as an asset for, for future companies. So you see those who have uh, 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 so, uh, social responsible policy, uh, um, uh, the company policy, yeah? and those who uh, take sustainability really ser uh, seriously will have uh, uh, a better position to attract the best talents. Of course, Industry 5.0 also means uh, sustainable industrial production. Uh, industry has a twofold role there. Uh, industry is uh, itself a major emitter, so industry itself has to become greener. And on the other hand, it's the industry which produces the technologies we need for the Green Deal and for the digital transformation. Um, yeah, how to make industry 5.0 uh, happen? There are uh, lots of things we have to do. But what I would like to particularly stress, we have to have a sort of uh, comprehensive approach. We have to act in all uh, uh, sectors of policy. So in, 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 in the technology policy, we have to look for, we have to make research development for human-centric technologies. We have to look into the interface between humans and technology and then a number of other things. But there are so many other policy areas where we have to act. Environmental policy, in education and training, this lifelong learning uh, 
also to 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 have the inclusivity there, huh? inclusiveness there. Sorry, we have to do something in employment policy, in social policy, and last but not least, of course, in uh, taxation. So we have to find a tax system which promotes green and human-centric industry. Um, last but not least, the three examples how EU-funded research contributes to, to Industry 5.0. These are three projects from Horizon 2020. The first one, Beyond 4.0, looks into the impact of new technologies on, 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 on business models, on welfare, on jobs. Another one, Human Manufacturing, looks at exactly at this interface between technology and humans. So how can we we combine this best to increase productivity, but also the satisfaction, the safety, and the quality um, of, of of the products delivered by the by the workers. And uh, last but not least, Kyklos 4.0 is a project dealing with circular manufacturing. Um, yeah, I think my 10 minutes home, so, uh, is uh, over. So if you want to have more information about that, I invite you to look at our webpage. There you might find the more detailed concept of Industry 5.0, and you might find other, other, other useful studies which give you a better insight. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much, Thanks Martin. Super interesting concepts um, and a very integrated approach as well. So plenty of food for thought to the audience. Please uh, do not hesitate to ask questions in the chat and also raise your hand at, after a PLX presentation. We are going to have like a, a discussion. So PLX, PLX on Ballon, the floor is yours. You also have um, 10 minutes uh, for your presentation. Right. Thank you so much, Arno. Uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you, everyone, for uh, the organization of this uh, wonderful day. And uh, I really did appreciate uh, Martin's presentation. Uh, that was that was uh, really interesting. I must say that I also um, I'm trying to find my little button to share full screen. Okay. No. Uh, great presentation, Martin, uh, on Industry 5.0. Uh, very comprehensive. Uh, really, really nice. I do have a question for you uh, afterwards, uh, but I really appreciate the concept. Uh, I did work uh, a little bit myself with the ACR group, uh, you know, directed by Sandrine uh, Dixon de Cleve on, on this issue of how to integrate yeah. Industry 4.0 and Industry 5.0. Um, really, really fascinating uh, framework. Uh, absolutely. So I, I'll, I'll have a question for uh, after if, if we do have time. All right, so um, what I want to talk about today is one of the backbone of Industry 5.0, which is Industry 4.0. So basically focusing on the technology and uh, not directly addressing the issue of sustainability or resilience of somehow, you know, kind of complex system thinking, but are really focusing on uh, the technological revolution that's happening. So I completely subscribe to Martin's definition of Industry 4.0. Uh, if I would add something on, on that, uh, you know, kind of really quickly to summarize what is Industry 4.0, it has to have some kind of revolution. So these technologies should really make a major change, a major leap forward in the way we work. So think about AI basically automating, you know, predictions. Think about blockchain automating transactions. Think about, you know, Web 3.0 uh, decentralizing some, uh, some kind of internet platforms. Think about basically any kind of technology that will have uh, tremendous spillovers in the way we organize economic activities. Um, and I wanna what I want to talk about today is uh, obviously that the regions that will embrace this industry 4.0 kind of you know, technologies uh, will have a major comparative advantage, okay? Because this kind of uh, industry 4.0 technologies, uh, they are uh, hugely tradable they can be fused at a distance massively. So essentially, you know, think about email services like Gmail being used by everyone in the Western world, but basically they also have a characteristic to be very, very concentrated in space. So these kind of complex technologies that really form the backbone of Industry 4.0, they have a tendency to diffuse massively in terms of knowledge consumption, but to be very, very concentrated in terms of, you know, the inventors that can actually produce this technology and diffuse them to the world. So you have this kind of dual effect of concentration of production and diffusion of consumption. And that really gives a, a challenge for, for regions that obviously manage to, to make the leap forward and be the producers of this uh, Industry 4.0 technologies, give them like a major comparative advantage. Now, one of the big problems here is like, how do you assess uh, systematically whether your region has an opportunity in one of the many, many, you know, Industry 4.0 technology? This is not a trivial question. 
and I've been working with a lot of regions across Europe, also in other countries in the world, to basically make this kind of assessment. And what I want to share with you is that there is a tool that basically can complement uh, human intelligence in the way we can assess systematically opportunities in these very complex technologies for which we, we have a hard time sometimes understanding the landscape and the, you know, uh, the overall opportunity set, which is basically building on a tool which is investment recommender systems. So uh, just you know to introduce really quickly to what, what, what this is about, think about when you're using uh, you know, YouTube, Spotify, Amazon, what's yeah, happening? Pierre-Alex, Pierre one thing, I think we have an issue with the, um, your presentation. Really? We don't, yeah, we don't see it uh, super well. I think it's zooming into, the, into your presentation. It's, uh, it's okay. Yeah. I mean, Arnaud, it's okay for me. Uh, it's okay for you. Elena? For me too. For me too, okay, it's okay. Too. Okay, excellent. <laughs> so we're all good then. All right. Um, so Not basically, if you, just to, to think about uh, what is a recommendation system in general, whenever you use YouTube, Spotify, and the system is making smart recommendation for you, it's basically analyzing your own preference set, but also connecting to what others usually listen to together, you know, kind of clustering using something we call graph-based machine learning. You might have heard about like collaborative filtering systems, which basically will allow you to make prediction on when you're gonna, what you might listen to next. So you're able to assess what you're gonna listen to next before having listened to the song. And that works the same for like, you know, uh, thread topics, news recommendation, product recommendation. Basically this kind of tool, this graph-based machine learning tool is powering, you know, most of the AI, modern AI that you witness or that you might not even be aware of. But that's basically, that's really what's underneath. And I would love to, di to dive into how that works because it's truly fascinating. It's a major revolution, uh, but of course I don't have time here. But basically the idea I wanna present is that we can use the same algorithmic principles to basically help regions to position themselves and map their opportunity set in industry 4.0. So uh, first of all, why do we need that? Uh, working with uh, you know cities and also organization uh, in general, because I think we, we don't not only have cities, regions, uh, you know, uh, representers and leaders uh, here, but also people from different type of organization. But essentially, what we have to understand is that the region that's going to bet on technologies of the future, in this case, Industry 4.0, you know, will thrive and others will decline. That is something pretty clear from the research on economic geography over the past 300 years. You know, a city or region success and fate is really tied to the type of technologies that they produce. And the big challenge for regions across the world is to manage to keep reinventing themselves to always be kind of ahead of the race. Now, the big issue in like, it's, it's all about making priorities. You know, it's the same in, in life in general. It's like, how do you make priorities? How do you focus on the right stuff for you? Uh, because there are like way too many new technologies. And when I work with decision makers being, you know, in regions, uh, country or organizations, um, you know, it's easy to get lost because these technologies, they evolve very, very quickly. Uh, I'm personally an expert on AI and blockchain. And even I really have to, you know, to watch out because the knowledge that you have, you know, three, three months ago might have evolved very, very quickly. So it's very hard to kind of, you know, stay on track on many, many technologies. Yeah, think about the different type of advanced machine tools, robotics. So it's really hard to assess what the technology is doing, how it's working. Uh, what are the global, you know, competitive landscapes? All of that is, is not straightforward. And that's something that uh, goes beyond, you know, human intelligence. Uh, and there is no systematic solution actually to do that uh, nowadays. So the goal is to develop this kind of uh, investment recommendation system to assist, uh, again, human decision. I'm not saying it's going to replace because it doesn't work that way. It really works as something that you build on top of, um, of, of human intelligence. And the way it works is pretty, pretty simple, okay? If you will have to map all opportunities in this framework, you have like the X axis, which is relatedness, tells you basically how far the region is of a specific industry for 0.0 technology, okay? So if it's like highly related, so basically on the right of this uh, framework, it means that you do have a lot of related capabilities, okay? So imagine, you know, to make an analogy with languages, being able to speak Italian and French, then it's gonna be really easy for you to speak Italian. So I don't need you to speak Italian already to be able to assess that you can speak Italian because I know that you speak French and Spanish 
And I know that French, Spanish, and Italian are kind of related. So by this kind of triangulation, it works the same with the recommendation system we discussed before, we can already kind of make an assessment of whether you get a chance or not to produce this new technology. And that is really the breakthrough of these kind of methods, because otherwise, you know, like um, older kind of data analytics, they tell you, okay, this, this kind of technologies, this is where, where they are concentrated now. But of course, what you want to be able to do is to make a prediction before, beforehand. So basically being able to step in the future and be like, these regions really have the capacity, okay? Not, they, they might not have the, the technology yet, but they do have the related capacity to do it. And that really allows you to evaluate whether the strategy of investing in a specific industry 4.0 is you know, risky or not. And the second one, which is complexity, basically gives you long-term potential in terms of value added of the technology. So if you focus on like, highly complex technologies, in a nutshell, a complex technology is like aerospace, like AI. These are technologies that have really huge global demand, but very few people can do it in the world. So essentially, you know, you're, you're really safe from like price, price competition and you can have like a huge comparative advantage in the future. So complexity is something we know how to, to, to measure and relatedness is something we know how to measure. So basically for every region in the world, you know, we can triangulate and we can assess the competitive landscape and we can assess whether a region has, you know, some kind of hidden opportunities uh, to develop some, some technologies, whether some strategies are kind of risky to basically evaluate the plan and also to highlight some technologies that the region might, might not have um, uh, envisioned itself. So when we talk about I4T, and, and of course, you know, the, the room is open to what you, what you throw in this, uh, in this kind of, uh, of framework, but we can think about additive manufacturing, AI, cloud computing, you know, quantum computers, autonomous robots. And basically the way this system works is first, we match the connection between these technologies and other technologies. So all these kind of yellow dots here, yellow bubbles on the on the map, they are different technologies. They might be biotech, they might be you know carbon capture. They are literally we have two hundred fifty thousand technologies uh, that we can we can exploit. So we look at how they're connected to these I forty technologies, and based on that, even if a region has absolutely zero activity in augmented reality. What we see is that if the region has a lot of related knowledge around augmented reality, then this is a viable, you know, path and, and strategy for the region to invest and try to boost this sector. Okay, that's basically how it works. Um, then you have here, you know, the, the connection between these different, uh, these different uh, technologies, if you're interested in that. Autonomous robots, for instance, of course, related to autonomous vehicles also related to additive manufacturing, 3D printing. And then you have like another kind of bubble here, another sphere of cluster around quantum computers, AI, cybersecurity, uh, that basically connect, uh, connect to each other. Now, if you map this industry 4.0 uh, technology, uh, and uh, this is not the number of, of patents or publication, this is again, you know, this recommendation system that triangulates. So it's a little bit different. So it basically looks at uh, whether these regions here have really strong opportunities or not to develop these technologies. And here is basically when we, we put them all together, all this industry 4.0, we put the, them all together to get an overall like kind of snapshot of what's going on in Europe. And what you see is a very strong level of uh, spatial concentration in the production of these technologies. So again, remember what, what I was saying earlier, which is this uh, industry 4.0 technology compared to other technologies have this feature of being highly concentrated when it comes to production, but really have a very, very global market. So are pretty easy to diffuse uh, across the world. So they're highly tradable. Uh, and then you, what you see is like the capital cities, uh, you know, regions around Europe having like a tremendous advantage in this industry 4.0, which also makes you know, in a way, uh, the, the role of policy very relevant to maybe some kind of arbitrage, this type of uh, huge spatial disparity, huh? and really makes makes you think very, you know, very strongly about the role of also like local governments uh, to step in uh, in the trajectory and the evolution of the region. Uh, just to give you an idea here, if we look at uh, the specific framework applied to a, a French region here, I won't say the name, uh, I can only say it's a French region. Basically, what you see here in this framework, if you focus on one of the I-40, which is AI, in this case, you see that the level of relatedness is pretty low, but the level of complexity is pretty high. So that's like a typical example of a region that obviously could scan the potential in AI, global potential, okay, you know, like not having AI today is, uh, is a risky strategy, 
But of course, what you see here is that you have much stronger opportunities in like uh, regenerative medicine, uh, electrical planes. You have also like oncology, uh, other type of, um, of activities where you have much stronger opportunities. So it's going to be much easier to invest in the bubble that are on the right and on the top, you know, and basically grow sectors around these bubbles in the region than the one on the left. Now, what's important here is to, of course, offer to the local decision maker this type of insight because they can make the decision afterwards. It's just like right now, the meaning of this, uh, of this graph is that you have a low level of uh, reality capability around AI in the region. Um, and that's important because then it, it allows you to assess whether it's a good strategy or not to invest in these technologies. And it's not because the level of relatedness is super low that you should not invest. It might, also, it might just mean that you might need to invest more to somehow compensate, okay? So that's like the first lesson. It's like uh, kind of related check. Do you have the investment potential that is kind of you know, matching the ambition that you have in the region? So that's kind of flagging a risky strategy and it requires a little bit more motivation, a little bit more investment to actually make it happen or it also requires to arbitrage. And in this case, in this region, uh, my, you, you might not want to go for like 39 of these technologies. You might have to really narrow down your focus and have some, um, uh, if you want, some, uh, some instruments that are very well targeted to AI. So you might have, want to have like specific yeah, well, instruments uh, when it comes yeah. to- uh, All right, so uh, this is- someone has the mic on, uh, but you might, you, you might want to basically to watch out. And then on the other end, you might have some technologies like super on the right and super on the top that you might not even think of, but might be very viable alternative. So, you know, not all regions in Europe. Yeah, Alex, one, one more minute, one more minute. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm finishing. So that's, uh, that's all good. Uh, well, perfect, actually. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. Thank, thank you. Th thank you, PLX. Very interesting uh, evidence-based approach for European regions to, to use. Um, I think we can start uh, questions. Mark, do you want to, do you have any, any questions? I've always got questions, Arnold, but uh, my preference is to have a look at the chat. And uh, I think there's a couple for you, Martin, uh, that because I had a chance to react. The first one, uh, let me just get my screen to move up. For Martin, it's quite a, a simple one. There's some longer questions, um, but uh, one has asked, uh, uh, so the difference between industry 4.0 and 5.0 is mainly the green part, isn't it? Martin, what do you say to that? Well, this is one of the, but the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the pillar or the the part of, of resilience and of human centricity is not necessarily green. It, it depends a little bit what you what you call uh, green. Mm. It's, it's it resembles the discussion what is sustainability. Sustainability in the broadest sense is includes social sustainability. So there is a lot of human centricity in the concept of sustainability. If you see this in a broader concept, in the near, more narrow concept, if you constricted to 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 i would say environment then uh this, so this is a, a question of, of nomenclature but what we understand usually as green it's more than that this yeah. human centricity is a completely different perspective mm. i think that's one of the key messages i heard in your presentation martin is this human dimension uh, mm -hmm. which it goes beyond just repeating the mantra green deal it is much more yeah. uh yeah. focused on the uh, say the skills dimension, the, uh, the transitions for uh, mm. uh, human dimension. So I think to, for that question, it's uh, only I, partial. I would like to say that we, uh, I don't, uh, so I have to admit, we have uh, severe discussions or and, and heated discussion whether uh, it is justified to call it Industry 5.0. Uh, mm. Yeah. The, the proponents of Industry 4.0 would would point at the uh, original strategy, which was basically the, um, um, I could say it was invented by, it's a German um, um, program, I would say. Yeah? And if you look into these basic concepts, you have a lot of Industry 5.0 potentially there. Mm. But the thing is, uh, it's it's often a footnote. Yeah? And, and if I remember, I, I saw uh, it was a commission document, uh, about uh, our the digital transition. It was, I think, a digital transition of industry. And it was, I think, 16 pages or something like that. And there was one footnote where they said, according to current um, uh, studies in 2035 or in 2030, 
2035, 50% of the jobs may be automated and disappear. Yeah? And this was just a footnote. Yeah? Okay, yeah. But if you think about this, uh, the consequence, it, it's, 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 it should Huge. be more than a footnote. Indeed, yeah. Another quick question. Uh, is the EU looking more towards industry 5.0 and away from 4.0? Simple question, uh, probably a complicated answer. <laughs> no, but it's 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 again this relationship between industry 4.0 and industry 5.0. It is not. Uh, it's uh, industry 5.0 doesn't make industry 4.0 obsolete. To the contrary, it's a cannot, continuum. Yeah, think, yeah, exactly. It's just it broadens the scope mm. and it shifts the perspective. Mm. It it mm. establishes uh, a little bit different priorities. Mm. But of course, we need all uh, all industry mm. 4.0 just with a with a more human centric. Mm. Uh, approach and a more green approach. Yeah. Okay. There's a question for you, Pierre Alexandre. Uh, it says, "What about Industry 4.0 Maturity Index, Acatec? Is it not a good tool for complex diagnosis?" Pierre Alexandre, is that something you're familiar with? So, just really quick uh, on on the Industry 4.0 and 5.0 discussion, completely agree uh, with the human dimension. Because one thing I want to say again is that these technologies are, are specific in the way that they generate a lot of inequality. And the idea of mm -hmm. Industry 5.0 is to go beyond that and kind of have this kind of, you know, globally inclusive society to compensate for exactly. that. So that's, that's something really important uh, that, that in, in a conversation. And uh, Mark, on, on this index, uh, I'm not familiar enough with this index, uh, to be honest. Uh, the, the nice thing with complexity is that we, we break it down to a very detailed level of analysis and that we can measure all kinds of technologies, doesn't matter how you call it. So uh, maybe the limitation of this index in general is that it's defined at one point in time by experts, but it's not something that can dynamically evolve. And imagine that one, you know, you don't include blockchain, for instance, in this index. You measure I-40, you know, technologies, and, and uh, the, whoever made this index did not include, does not believe that blockchain should be there, for instance. Well, then you're limited. Uh, or if what, what if things evolve and change? So this uh, index that we have, you know, is basically also based on natural language processing, which means policymakers, decision makers come up with whatever they, they have in mind and whatever name they have for the technology. And then we can always have the flexibility to make this assignment and, and this measurement. But I'd love to um, to check it out and maybe like make a comparison with what we have. That would be interesting. But I do believe that there is also value added in, in, um, in, in the index I, I mentioned. Okay. Uh, I know, I see on screen that Dominic has taken the trouble to raise his golden hand. So I will let him ask a question. Yeah. Okay. Pierre Alexandre, just before, there's some questions from Ninetta and Margaret. You might want to answer using the chat in case Arnaud tells me we, we run out of time. But Dominic, uh, go ahead and answer, ask your yeah. question, please. Thank you so much. I hope you can hear me well. And I would like to take this unique opportunity to directly um, yeah, point a question to Martin. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, the introduction of this concept, Industry uh, 5.0. Um, just my thinking is um, 10 years ago, we started with 4.0. And by then, we have really created a worldwide recognized brand. And now with uh, 5.0, isn't it? that we put that into danger, what we have created, because a lot of that, uh, I agree, we can put more emphasis on the human, but we have already integrated that uh, in 4.0 from my point of view. I remember all the discussions, the papers that we have written in 2011, Professor Valsta always mentioned the human have to stay in the center and it's human driven. And um, also it has to be agile and resilient. So all of that was already there. And also, we always said, you know, industrial revolution has to be driven by new technologies and new uh, social circumstances. And I don't see the new technological paradigms that would really justify to talk about the fifth industrial revolution right now already. Um, we look around our SMEs, they are by far not ready to be called 4.0. Why do we start to talk about the 5.0? I mean, maybe that's a more general discussion. Many, maybe many other people raise these questions. Mm. But um, it's, yeah. you know, it's I think it's behind some of the points people were mentioning. So Dominic, that's a good yeah. emphasis. But Martin, what what what, what do you say to that? Uh, you are not the first uh, to to raise exactly this mm. this complaint, mm. um, and and it's partially true. Yeah, uh, this is a certain. We also feel a sort of bit of unease as this is a, a break with the usual nomenclature. If you if you uh, if you think about these industrial revolutions, this we are clear cut major changes. Huh? 
So you had uh, to mechanization, then it was introduction of electricity and the introduction of computers. So these were big changes. It's not like that in uh, from industry 4.0 to industry 5.0. So from this perspective, I understand that people are a little bit uneasy to talk about industry 5.0. You could call it, I don't know, 4.2 or something like that. Eh? And I also have to admit, if you look into this concept, as I said before, many elements are there, but if you look, what role do they really play in, in actually uh, implement, implementing that, then you see it is, I wouldn't say just lip service, but it, it does not have the, the priority it needs to have also in, in terms of what happens now with, with the world, uh, we, we see with the, with the greenhouse gas emissions and also with COVID, for example. So uh, Industry 5.0 is primarily um, a, a shift in perspective and a broadening of, of the scope. Although I have to admit, uh, a lot of things, uh, a lot of these elements are already visible in Industry 4.0 in the concepts, but less in the implementation. But it's uh, maybe Pierre Alexandre, the, because it's exactly what ASIA looked into, and they have uh, a very powerful arguments to, to really say that it is justified to go beyond 4.0 also with the, with the brand. Well, Mark, I think our time is up. Uh, thank you very much, Martin. Thank you very much, Pierre okay. Alexandre, for being here. Great keynote uh, speakers, great discussion. It would be nice to go on, but we have to, to move on yeah. in our next session. I've seen Pierre Alexandre's answering in the chat as well. So uh, yeah. carry on uh, asking questions. And I think hopefully, Ninetta, you have a, a response from Pierre with a yes. useful link. So Yes. And, and Pierre Alexandre, if you stay during like this networking break, we will put you with people who had the questions for you. So if you can say 10 minutes more, we put you with, uh, with the persons. I have 10 minutes. Excellent. Perfect. Thanks a lot. Good luck. So let's break in uh, okay. networking rooms, get to know each other, and then we come back for the good practices. All right. Welcome back, everyone. All right. Excellent. I think we, we can start. I see people now. Uh, Coming back, or was your networking break, Mark? Well, I, I'm, I'm glad one person turned on their camera. But, uh, otherwise, the others went for a proper coffee break and left me on my own with uh, with one other person. But we had a good chat. Excellent. Yeah, me as well. I get to learn a little bit about future casts. You know, industry 4.0 for construction industries. So mm. interesting. Yeah. So let's start our session. So um, in this session, we are going to learn more about Interreg Europe uh, good practices. Uh, those uh, good practices and uh, discussions um, that are going to present are coming from three uh, different uh, Interreg Europe projects. Uh, so digital regions, Inno industry, and Smarty, and you know those projects have uh, for objective to deliver uh, better industry 4.0 uh, policies. So let's, we will have a look at, you know, a case in a, of industry 4.0 infrastructure in Switzerland with the Switzerland Innovation Park in BLBN. And we will look also at Flanders Make, um, you know, with a presentation for Rir van der Kirchhoff. And then we have two discussants um, Jorge and uh, Spela. So it's going to be very interesting. I think I can leave the floor first um, to um, Dominique. Dominique will present uh, the Switzerland Innovation Park and the Swiss uh, Smart Factory. So Dominique, you have eight minutes and uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much, Arno. And um, I hope you can see my screen by now. Yes, it's good. And you can hear me well? Perfect. Yes, yeah, perfect. Okay. You did already the introduction. I'm going to present um, the innovation policy regarding the fourth industrial revolution here in the canton of Bern. Um, the canton of Bern is traditionally a high value manufacturing area. So we have um, a lot of industry. If you think about watchmaking and watchmaking came actually from textile industry in the past and has now also 
transformed further, forward into medical device technology and uh, machine tool industry. So it's it's a very um, yeah industrial um, area with uh, a lot of industrial heritage. Also, it's a beautiful area, and I can say that as I'm German and I came here five years ago to Switzerland to start uh, my work at the Swiss Smart Factory. We have decided to uh, create a manufacturing hub here in the center of this region in the year 2017. And I just can move my camera and you see um, I'm in the middle of our uh, demo lab and transfer center that I'm going also to present you later on a little bit in my eight minutes. Okay, so um, where does Switzerland stand in terms of the fourth industrial revolution? Um, you must notice that Switzerland is a country that works pretty much bottom up. Unlike many other countries in Europe, there was at the beginning no top-down government-driven industry for zero initiative. Nevertheless, um, companies here have also, of course, always interest on innovation and have invested in new technologies. And um, it's surprising to see that Switzerland is an innovation leader when it comes to the classical um, innovation uh, scoreboard, the uh, regional innovation score. We have looked in that as part of our project and we can say Switzerland <clears throat> performs relatively good compared to other European countries, 40% above the EU average. Now, our region itself, the region of Bern, or it's also translated in Espas Mittelland, um, rank the lowest in Switzerland, according to um, this digitalization index. And uh, we have tried to understand why is that. And um, we found out that the collaboration between companies um, that could be increased. So we have a lot of world market leaders, hidden champions here in the region, small, medium sized companies um, that are extremely good in what they do. They're very much hardware based. They are mastering high precision manufacturing, but um, they stay a lot among themselves. And digitalization is about connecting, right? It's about connecting technologies, but also connecting companies. They have to start to do business together and um, yeah, exchange data. And so, I mean, that was probably one reason why the region here has not performed so well uh, compared to other regions in Switzerland. Because, um, for example, as I said, the watchmaking industry traditionally is very closed and um, they, they, they collaborate only among themselves. So we needed to open that a bit. And we um, also mm -hmm. have started um, in the Digital Regions Project a advisory board uh, of different experts um, and we have met several times and we have analyzed these situations and we found also out that actually there's a lot of support out there already in Switzerland with different initiatives aiming at the fourth industrial revolution, aiming at digitalization and we try to better understand what these initiatives are doing, what they're offering and we try to cluster them in different categories. Where are they located? Where, is the, where do they have the biggest influence? Which areas are they looking at? Do they have maybe yeah, some, some focus areas in terms of technologies? Or are they probably supporting more the early innovation process with workshops and ideation? Or are they also supporting the implementation of technologies and the um, market introduction? So that was very helpful. And um, that is something I come back later on with my recommendations. Also, we started to do a micro analysis um, with an online survey and certain interviews that we have performed with local in, uh, companies, uh, 32 participants. And we were very surprised that many companies were not very much familiar with the concept of industry for zero, almost 60%. And then also, um, if we look at this uh, survey, we saw that the digitalization roadmap was not developed yet. The companies were not aware that there are initiatives and funding opportunities supporting them. So we, we, we really saw, okay, we could do better. We could help them. These companies are short in time. They're good in the daily business. 
and they probably don't have the time to look around and discuss what type of offer is on the table. I come back to that in the end. Classically, what we say is collaboration is key to cope with the digital transformation. And there are um, platforms that support this type of collaboration between these companies. So that's my good practice that I would like to introduce to you. Provide a collaboration platform. Um, we as the Swiss Mile Factory, we are an open platform for technology adoption. We are a neutral platform. Often we refer to ourselves like a demilitarized zone. We have here 1,000 square meters of laboratory floor on which um, companies can come and you know work with us. We provide them a project. It's called a lighthouse project. It's a production line where we produce drones and companies can join this project, input their knowledge, input their hardware, and uh, yeah, exploit this platform in a collaborative approach in terms of marketing, in terms of research, in terms of whatever they need. So I think that's, that's um, what we have experienced and which works very well here in, in our region to provide a tangible place for collaboration with the Swiss Smart Factory. By now we have more than 60 industrial partners joining us from startups to a very big global brands. And the Swiss Smart Factory is a place um, where we show how production of the future can look like and companies can come and test before they invest in the future technology. So this is like a, a test center, but it's also a supermarket of ideas and solutions. So um, you can come here, you, you be inspired, you see what is possible and what you can buy and integrate already today. Of course, we do also research in our offices, but what we show here in the lab is, is, is really market ready and that's quite important. And when you are interested, you, we, we just not only um, explain you, this is the technology, but we also refer you to the experts. We are a small team of 10 people, but our expert network is, 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 is growing and is huge with more than 60 companies. And I think that's very valuable so that we also uh, refer to the respective contacts in our network. Um, that's my recommendation for you. To, if, you if your region is, 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 is want to do a step forward, probably you could also build an open platform for technology adopt, adoption. Um, we have learned that it's important to be tangible to, to, to uh, have a physical platform where collaboration can happen. I know uh, Teams meetings, Zoom meetings are great, but um, it's, it's just so different if you're here and you can have workshops on the physical matter. And um, building up such an infrastructure, I know it's not easy, it's expensive, the investment at the beginning, but also keeping it running, we can really uh, yeah, sing a song, it's, it's painful. Uh, it needs to be constantly adapted, uh, software has to be updated, hardware has um, problems and needs to, needs to be exchanged. So it's, 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 it's a process that um, is difficult to, to maintain. And it's important that you involve the industrial partners from the beginning with a clear commitment um, we ask for a membership fee between six and 12,000 Swiss franc per year. That is helpful to have, for example, one technician that is taking care of the infrastructure. And then, of course, when we need new hardware or software, the companies sponsor this and they can also send us the experts to do the maintenance. So um, find, find a way to collaborate with the local um, industrial partners to keep this platform running. It's their platform. You are just the, let's say the neutral instance that um, provides the service, yeah? But you, you, you need to sell it as their platform. Um, we have nice videos online. I'm thinking the time is not enough to go into it, but uh, follow us on, on, on LinkedIn or on YouTube. You find there um, a little bit more about the way we work and how also how partners can have a benefit because we promote them in the videos. Again, um, we we are neutral, we, we don't put emphasis only on one partner. We say there are many solutions out there. They're all good, but you know, um, that's, it's anyway, um, you know, important to, 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 to be a network and show what's out there. For the second point, uh, just to, to give you a, a, another recommendation, 
on the macro level, as we found out in our project, many initiatives are out there. Um, we don't need just another initiative. It is rather important that we bring more transparency into the available initiatives. And I think um, Switzerland, for example, would benefit of a network of a network where the existing initiatives can, you know, um, get together and yeah, um, synchronize themselves. And also we see um, where are the best fit between the initiatives, where, where do they differentiate between each other and that they have a common access point um, where the companies find in a quick fashion on a yeah, very easy the information they need and they can establish the contact to the initiative that really uh, suits their needs. So I think that is another um, recommendation from our side on the macro level. And with this, I have finished my talk and I'm not sure if I really managed the eight minutes, but <laughs> I hope. Perfect, no worries. No worries. Thank you very much, Dominique. Indeed, uh, very, very interesting initially showing the role of infrastructures in the diffusion of uh, Industry 4.0 technologies. So we will move on to uh, our next uh, presenter. Stay with us, Dominique, because I see there are already some good questions in the chat and please participants use the chat and raise your hand uh, after our presentations. Uh, here, Flanders make the floor is yours and you also have um, eight eight minutes. Thank you very much, Arno. And also thank you, Dominique, for the presentation. I could not agree more with your uh, recommendations. So you will see lots of it back in, in my presentation as well. Um, I will talk a little bit on, uh, on the region of Flanders um, and what's going on in Flanders related to Industry 4.0. Then I will talk about how the industry looks at it, looks at it. and uh, last but not least, I will talk a little bit, two slides on Flanders make, being a good practice in, uh, in terms of bringing infrastructures close to companies. Well, we are now part of the Smarty uh, Interact Europe project, uh, but we have also been part in a previous project called Inno InfraShare. By the way, I see partners of both projects in, in the audience, so very welcome. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, what's going on in Flanders. Um, Industry 4.0. Industry 4.0 is one of the six or seven transition domains in Flanders, which means that Industry 4.0, the, the movement towards Industry 4.0 is managed uh, by uh, what we call a single point of contact. So there's somebody in the government which is responsible for the transition. Um, and uh, it's all about people and technology. I think we also we already talked about that in the previous presentations, but it's also about business models. Because what we see in Flanders is that many companies, they know about technology, they know also that it's about people, but they don't know, know how to, they don't really know how to make money with it yet huh, with all these technologies. So these business models are in many occasions a roadblock or a showstopper to define them. Now Flanders make is active in um, in different actions related to Industry 4.0. So we perform um, research. Let me see if I, yeah. We perform research, uh, basic and industrial research in, uh, in the knowledge area. We are active in different living labs, demos and pilots. I will come back to that uh, later. Uh, and we also coordinate the offer to the industry because we have seen that uh, the offer in Flanders is very scattered. It's a very complex landscape. All different types and kinds of actors are offering services related to Industry 4.0. Um, we have seen that there was not much coordination going on from the government, so we helped them a little bit. Um, and now I will come back to that later. There's a platform, etc. And also skills and organization and infrastructure, they go together because uh, our infrastructures are used to validate our research results, but also to train people and to help people build up uh, knowledge uh, in the companies. Now, looking at uh, Industry 4.0 uh, from a governance point of view, or from the policy point of view, um, the government, uh, Flemish government had, has uh, done a lot related to um, uh, building the community of Industry 4.0. So there's an Industry 4.0 signpost where companies can find 
different technologies, different actors uh, related to Industry 4.0. And there's 17 living labs at the moment active uh, in Flanders. Um, so it's a living lab, for example, about drone technology, cybersecurity, uh, operator support, digital training. And we try to be active in, uh, in many of these uh, living labs because they bring knowledge and uh, also technology close to, to the companies. But also, apart from what uh, the Flemish, uh, let's say, policy makers have been doing, we have performed the uh, um, same as I saw in, in Switzerland, um, an industry 4.0 survey in Flanders. And what we saw there was, uh, was that uh, on the left-hand side, that 66% of the companies we interviewed, because we did it with interviews, um, they already have some kind of a plan in place. 40% um, is, uh, is already implementing that plan uh, and 27% is, uh, has the plan, but it's not yet in execution mode. So that was quite what we saw, an astonishing number of companies which is working on Industry 4.0 and which is doing that in a planned uh, way. Looking at the relative position to the, to the competition, 70% uh, thinks that they are at least on par with their, comp with their competitors. Uh, and 30% still has uh, some way to go. So quite a few companies think that, uh, that they are either advanced or at the same uh, level. The survey was done in 2019, but the, the report was published just before the COVID-19 crisis in 2020. Now, the biggest potential for improvement is seen by the companies as the digital shop floor. 80% says uh, we have a lot of improvements to do on the shop floor, and we see that digital technologies can help us a lot. Uh, and the same goes for new ways of product development. Um, so companies, they, they see less improvement in, uh, in products or in digital business uh, models. Talking about the biggest challenges, um, and that was not really surprising uh, for us. 60% um, says digital talent is, uh, is a big problem. 57% says digital culture. We see that the, the um, let's say, the um, companies which are very active in Industry 4.0 related uh, technologies and projects, they really have a digital culture. Successful companies have a digital culture, which is deployed throughout the organization. And that starts with, with, the, with the management. So what you see down below in the graph is that intellectual property and technology infrastructure is less seen as a challenge or an inhibitor. Now coming to, back to Flanders Make. Um, Flanders Make is a research center for the industry. Uh, so our core process is setting up and performing research projects with the industry where companies can take part. They can use our knowledge. They can use our infrastructure in these projects. And many of our projects are, of course, related to, to the technologies uh, for Industry 4.0. Our research is based on what we, what we see as four very dominant market trends nowadays. Uh, products, but also production product, production systems, they get more and more smart, more and more interconnected. They start talking to each other, exchanging information via sensors, etc. Customized products at the price of serial production. Um, we see that in the companies that lot sizes are getting smaller and smaller. Um, so these production systems, they have to be very agile, very flexible to handle these small lot sizes and products become more and more customized. We already talked about sustainability and human-centered. We see that as a very dominant uh, market trend, uh, which has a lot of influence on how you design your, your products, but also your production uh, systems. The role of Flanders make is uh, to look forward and follow the trends. And we try to translate these trends in, into roadmaps and, and uh, also deploy them to, uh, to the companies we work with. We also sometimes Companies we work with don't see the problems ahead of them. So we help them then to formulate the, the challenges and the opportunities and we inspire them. Uh, we also try to de de develop competences and disseminate them to the companies, to create and transfer knowledge. Um, and we also uh, connect companies, building ecosystem, 
the ecosystem which helps companies to be connected to each other, to learn from each other, uh, and to learn also from, from the knowledge uh, centers. Uh, talking about infrastructure, uh, Flanders Make has 17 different uh, labs. Uh, many of these labs are located in the Flemish universities. Uh, and each and every lab has a certain uh, dedicated infrastructure, which is used to validate research results, of course, in the first place, but also to test and demonstrate new solutions. Um, and all these infrastructures are open to companies. Um, so we try to also encourage companies to come to us to, uh, to develop their products, to develop their processes, to test uh, new solutions on our infrastructure. Um, and we see that that is um, in the first few years, there was quite some reluctance uh, of companies that didn't know what was going on, uh, how to use it. But now we have developed a system and the structure that it's uh, very easy for companies to, uh, to join us and to, to use the infrastructure. Now, as an example, uh, and that's uh, my last slide about infrastructure, uh, I would mention our Make Lab, Flanders Make Lab, because that's what I would see as uh, a lab which is uh, widely used. It's already a few years old, but it's still, still very alive and kicking. It's a mobile uh, lab, a trailer, in fact, which we use to, uh, to go to companies to put the trailer on the parking lot and to invite operators to experience new digital technologies, being it uh, artificial intelligence, collaborative robotics, Internet of Things, uh, digital work instructions, etc. Because these operators in the companies, they, um, they would not really come to Flanders Make huh, to, to work in our labs. So we, we thought, well, we might as well go to the companies and invite the operators there. Um, so companies can hire our Make Lab for a day or two days, um, and then we train. We also train the, train the operators. Now, looking at a few recommendations, uh, what we see is that, and that's also what I hear, heard from Dominique, is that the involvement of the industry is extremely important. Uh, so in our organization, the industry is all over. It's in our board of directors, in uh, our projects, in our advisory boards, etc. Um, so the industry also defines the topics uh, of our uh, projects and also defines which industry to invest in. With, we have experience that we need a stable uh, funding base from the government uh, and also a roadmap to grow beyond uh, subcritical uh, because we started as a very small organization. But now we are with 700 researchers in, uh, in the last seven years. Um, and we couldn't have done that without support from the government. You need to be best in class. Uh, infrastructure needs to be state of art. Um, and that's what we try to do. And the domains are defined by, by uh, the industry. Um, and also it's very important to act in an open innovation ecosystem. Um, we see that uh, companies very much like to learn from each other, learn from experiences, from peers. Um, and also from, from research uh, institutes. So we invite colleague uh, research institutes, we invite companies, we have workshops, masterclasses, et cetera, where experience can, experiences and good practices can be shared. Last but not least, yeah, I was attending uh, a European uh, workshop uh, last week uh, that was also about infrastructure, but it was about a very big uh, clean rooms, electron colliders, et cetera. But I think we think at Flanders Make that small is beautiful uh, because for example, we talk about one single robot, one single platform, which also can be transferred from our labs to the, uh, to the companies and which then can be tested by the companies on their shop floor. Uh, so also very small pieces of infrastructure are very instrumental to deploy these technologies to, uh, to the companies. And that's, I think, my last slide. And now I hope I have been able to do it in eight minutes. Excellent. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Riel. Super interesting, um, especially the Flanders Make Lab. Uh, and indeed, small is beautiful. Uh, and those can be replicated in many uh, European regions. So let's move on to our discussions. And let's start with the lead partner from Inno uh, Industry. Uh, Spela uh, Sechnik, if I pronounce it right, 
please, you have five minutes and, and the floor is yours. And here, if you can stop the uh, share screen. Yes, perfect. So hello, good afternoon from my side. I want to thank you for the invitation. So my name is Spela Sechnik. I am an, a regional advisor in regional development agency Posalia in Slovenia. And first of all, I would like to thank the program for the invitation to participate on today's workshop in the name of our agency. Uh, we, we are very pleased to be able to share some experience from our region and of course from our in industry project and partnership. Of course, uh, I believe we can all agree on um, all the discussions and all the presentations that uh, industry 4.0 and the digitalization in all sectors are our future, uh, whether we are keen to it or not. Uh, so it is very important to have different projects and studies such as are funded under the Interreg Europe. Also uh, one, one of uh, these projects is in industry. So uh, thank you again. So uh, maybe just to reflect on the, the, um, the presentations, uh, I believe that uh, if I draw a conclusion on both presentations, uh, the cooperation and the learning is key uh, for the, the implementation of digitalization and industry 4.0. And also our you know, industry project is a partnership of 10 different regions or countries. So uh, we are learning from each other uh, from the beginning to the end. So throughout the project, we have identified 29 good practices. I believe our policy officer, Anna, already shared a link to the chat and I, I would very much like to invite you to visit it. Um, and to browse through it. Of course, there is not enough time to present all 29 good practices, but I will just focus on the two, um, which are very um, in cooper in um, intertwine and they can reflect on what we have heard a few minutes um, ago. Just a moment. So I hope you can all see this web, web page. So the Digital Innovation Hub is a one good practice that was um, uh, that is a part of our good practice database. Uh, so this is a one-stop shop in Slovenia for getting information and support regarding the digital transformation of companies. The focus is on SMEs and not so much on the public sector, which I think is very important. And it works in four different fields establishing a digital ecosystem, a direct support to SMEs in the form of mentoring, integration at national and EU level and promotion of digitalization. So uh, they work closely with the Slovenian Entre Entrepreneurship Fund. This is the second good practice and they have formed vouchers. So these are the vouchers I have um, shared on the screen. So we have four different uh, voucher for, vouchers for the digitalization. So one is for raise, raising digital competencies, for the preparation of digital strategy, for digital marketing and for cybersecurity. And the funding is 60%. Is co the co-financing, so I believe this is a, a very good percentage. And um, just to reflect, in 2019, 1,946 projects were supported. So I believe this is a, quite a success. And as we speak, a questionnaire from the Digital Innovation Hub is in progress regarding the current state of play of digitalization uh, in SMEs in Slovenia. So we are very eager to see the results, to see uh, whether the vouchers have changed anything, and I am sure they have. And these um, um, results will be presented by the end of November. So um, maybe to conclude, um, of course, the cooperation is key also to educate and to do the research and um, to transform these SMEs, um, of course, to raise their digital competencies. So uh, I believe that these vouchers are a really good uh, practice, exa um, good example maybe to, uh, for other regions. 
So this is all from me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fela. In, indeed, Innovation Ventures, a great tool. And we have um, some knowledge uh, in Intrager Policy Learning Platform to share as well with uh, articles. Uh, and also, we did the online discussion. Uh, Jorge, uh, the floor is yours now. You also have uh, five minutes. Uh, be very quick and try to reflect also on the on the good practices and the and the keynote speakers in your presentation. Yeah, is Jorge you you muted and we cannot see you. No, I can see myself. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Otherwise, let's let's um, you know let's take questions. I, I saw there was a, a question for Dominique, and and then we we come back to you, uh, Jorge, when when you figure I, it out. No, I think that I can. Okay. Because. Because I, I think that if I if I share the screen, you cannot uh, hear me or yes the, the yes so, yes. So well, what just, to, excellent. Just to, talk to, to, without to presentation. Make some reflection. Yes. yes. Perfect. Excellent. So well, first of all, thank you for the invitation and for being with you with, with some colleagues from our uh, internet projects from Cantabria. And well, I, I want to share with you some of the some of these uh, reflections and. Of the contributions that our colleagues from from Flanders and from from Switzerland have, have made us. Uh, one important thing that uh, both uh, colleagues uh, have shown us is that uh, well, industry 4.0 must have been built on industrial heritage. So, for to advance on industrial digitalization, first, of course, what we need is industry. So, we need to to be uh, to, to have our role of, of, the, of the industry very, very clear and to have uh, or to, or to base our regional and national strategies on what we can call championships or champions of the regions or areas where we can develop these kind of technologies. Uh, the second idea that most of our colleagues have shared with us is that it's very important to connect technologies and companies. So it's very important to, to be focused on, on this, this kind of things and to evaluate and to check the existing technologies. So not, not to try to reinvent or existing or, or previous technologies and to, to have a real map of what our regions are doing in relation with digitalization of the, of the industry. Another important point is to exchange experiences from and to other ecosystems, so from the same ecosystem we can learn some actions and of course we can exchange those best practices to other ecosystems and to other experiences. Uh, the fourth idea that I want to, to, to highlight is uh, the, the model of people, technology and business. So the, the three pillars of both models from the Swiss model and the Flanders model were based on people, technology and business. All the three all the three aspects were very important. Uh, and one important thing that I have seen in the, in, the, in the polls and in the studies that both regions have made is that the biggest challenge that they appoint or that, that they highlight is the talent and culture instead of technology, adoption of technology. So technology, I think that it's cheap to adopt, but what is expensive is to, to make the talent and the culture to follow up with this uh, uh, digitalization and this technology revolution. Some of the good practices that were in common or that have uh, basic things in common, platforms is another important uh, word that both uh, uh, practices have in, in common. Uh, collaboration and cooperation, this is a very important aspect of of the good practices, test solutions, and the importance of experts. To have experts in, in the region or to attract 
experts from other regions are important aspects of the of the group practices. And well, the the, the basic idea that the it's not the, the the most important point of the infrastructure is not to to have expensive infrastructures or large infrastructures. The the, the most important thing is to have the or, or to put the the infrastructures at the services of the companies. So to have an open space in order to test solutions to see real aspects of digitalization and especially to, to have uh, some areas to test before invest for the companies. Those I think that are the, the, the most important aspects that I can highlight from, the, from our uh, guest speakers. And, and of course, the, the support from the regional and the national governments in the, in the, in the, in the areas of vouchers, grants, open calls, of course, <clears throat> all right thank you very much Jorge, for these uh, reflections i think we can open the the floor for for discussions i saw that there was already a question for dominique and dominique is the question was about the technologies that you have uh, in your technology platform so if you can Tell us a little bit more, and then I'm sure Mark has a, has a lot of questions for, for us as well. Yeah, uh, yeah, of course. Um, so we try to cover, let's say, uh, the three forms of integration connected to Industry 4.0. The vertical integration with uh, sensor technology, edge and clouds, and also advanced human interaction schemes. So basically, what does it do, the, the vertical integration? We take data from the shop floor and we provide it to decision-making me mechanisms using advanced analytics and the human capabilities with yeah, um, intuitive UIs. Then on the horizontal level, horizontal integration, we try to integrate the supply chain. We do that with auto ID technologies like RFID. Um, and digital twins of the products where a product describes itself from the start of the production process to the um, yeah to the customer and also what is very important close the loop with concepts for d and remanufacturing and recycling and uh, last there is the digital continuity with uh, engineering simulation that is more and more based on digital twins again so we use um, data models and we enrich them during the life cycle of our products for yeah, new type of applications such as virtual training, marketing, um, co-simulation and continuous optimization of our products and machines. So uh, there's a wide span of technologies, but they're all really somehow um, very much integrated in this definition of the fourth industrial revolution. Thank you. Thank you, Dominique. If, if I can follow up perhaps mm. a, a question, it, it's to both Dominique and uh, uh, To what extent, uh, given that we're in the Interreg Europe community, so collaboration, cooperation, cross-border are, are common themes. Uh, so we maybe first to, to, to you, Dominic, and then because I've got two questions for her. Dominic, what, to what extent do you have or non-Swiss SMEs coming to your platforms? To what extent are they open and, uh, uh, and is there a different sort of pricing model or, or system for their uh, engagement? No, no, absolutely not. Um, the price is the same. We are open to everyone. Um, I would say the um, yeah, the, the requirement is that you can actively participate in the platform. Mm -hmm. But we have many great companies from France, Germany, uh, and Austria. Um, mm -hmm. There is a is a German robotic startup. They become quite famous. They are actually quite at the border to to Switzerland, and for them. Becoming partner here is a chance to also enter the Swiss market, be present on the Swiss market. And um, no, we, we, we even reach out to countries like Japan and Korea and can collaborate with them. Um, but it, it has to have yeah, some, some outcome. So, so it must be meaningful, this type of collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, if you only want to be here to show your logo, I think that's not 
that's not the, the, the idea of this collaboration then. But if you have a chance to integrate your technology, to be here from time to time, even virtually, um, then it doesn't matter where you are. So you can join us from all over the world. Okay, thanks. And uh, to what extent are the, are the Flanders platform used uh, in a sort of, a, say, interregional cross-border dimension? Do you have a, a number of uh, neighboring country SMEs uh, or even laboratories coming to, to work with your um, community? Um, yes, uh, although it's, it's not very widespread, I would say, Mark. Uh, I think proximity is quite important in our, in our case. Huh? So what we did, for example, we deployed uh, the Make Lab, our mobile lab, mm. uh, a few times to uh, our northern uh, the colleagues from the north, Holland, huh? the, the province of North Brabant in, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, we used the Make Lab for an event, for example, on the high tech campus there in Eindhoven, where different companies could, could join. Um, we also have a company from, uh, from Holland, uh, one or two companies uh, which worked in our own labs in, uh, in Flanders. Um, but I think that their proximity is, an, is, an, is very important. Huh? We have not seen companies from France or Germany um, asking uh, to do tests in, in, in our labs yet. Okay. And as a follow-up question, you, I mean, you mentioned the sort of public uh, policy uh, baseline funding as being an important uh, criteria. Um, to, to what extent are, are they, uh, let's say, dictating a, an investment agenda that's aligned with their own uh, policy priorities? You know, for example, the smart specialization choices that they may uh, decide upon and uh, to what extent do you find that being uh, uh, used to shape the, uh, the platform development strategy? Yeah. yeah, everything we do within Flanders Make as a research institute is based uh, on a contract we have with the Flemish government. And this contract, the, the, the basis of this contract is a business plan. We develop every four years. Mm -hmm. um, the Flemish government is part of our governance structure, huh? so they... Also, I wouldn't say they are, in, they are influencing, but they help us try to define, uh, let's say, the business plan. And it, to be honest, in fact, Flanders Make is a result of the smart specialization strategy of Flanders, because one of the actions there was to create uh, a research industry for the, for the, for the manufacturing industry. Yeah? So we are mm. right in the middle of that uh, scope. Um, but I would say... The majority of what we do is is um, is dedicated to the companies, and the companies also define uh, a lot of things and a, and a lot of projects we do. And to a lesser extent, the government. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for those two uh, responses, both of you. Are there any other? Uh, points or anyone wants to raise their hand using the uh, the golden hand and, and uh, ask directly and just remember to turn your microphone off if you're not speaking yeah i think nineta your your mic is is on and um i think i think it's time to to break into working groups mark now do, what do you think you, you make it, your mic is off. Yeah, well. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I think we, we can do that. Uh, All right. Speak. So so let me uh, close the, the session. I would like to thank many thanks to our speakers, uh, Dominique, Rir, uh, Jorge, and Ashpela. I think you, you raised, you, you illustrated very, very good um, and interesting good practices. Uh, so thank you for that and a lot of... Um, good practices to, to inspire uh, our participants in their policies for industry.40. Um, thank you very much. So I saw that Eugenie also sent the, the survey. So please take our, our, our follow-up survey here. You have the link to say if you like this event and, and what you would like to, to do in next, next event and so on. Now we're going to break into two different working groups. 
So I'm going to have one uh, working group. Mark is going to have another one. We are going to exchange about our experience related to Industry 4.0 and, and get to know where we're from and what type of initiative and challenges that we have in our policies. So I think it's time to break um, and let's do uh, two uh, different uh, working groups.